Let's start off with Hebrews 11. Now, one of the things that we're going to talk about to receive power from God is faith. It's faith. Faith has power, and we've learned some reasons why. In Ephesians 6, it quenches the fiery darts of the wicked. So it quenches the fiery attacks of Satan, which connects to the filling of your spirit, the filling of the spirit. Because remember, Satan's fiery darts, it's intended to weaken the power of the filling spirit. So when you lose the power of the filling spirit, what you need to do to regain the filling spirit power back is to have faith. Faith is that substitute power that will block off, quench the attacks of Satan, and then you just yield to the Holy Spirit again, and then you refill yourself in the Holy Spirit. If your hand's at Hebrews 11, turn your other hand to 1 John chapter 5. So that's one thing we know about faith. Another thing we do know about faith, I briefly mentioned it, but it has something to do where all creation is dependent upon it. So I was trying to prove that faith has power. So creation is dependent upon it. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. Also, there's another verse that talks about if you have faith as a grain of a mustard seed, say to the mountain, be thou removed, it will be removed. So I really believe faith uh, that this is a substance itself that has much power, but we need to act upon it. That's our issue. Amen. Another verse to prove that faith has power is 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. Now, we all sing this song. You all know this. Verse 4, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Now, you see that? That's a victory that what? Overcomes the world. So, if you're talking about world power, if you want a power to basically not control the world but overcome it, that's faith. That's how powerful it is. So we proved again that faith is definitely powerful. It's something where creation is dependent upon it, where mountains can be moved. And also that overcomes the world. All right, there's no doubt about that. Now, let's get into more practical apps, aspects. We've examined faith itself, what it is. It is a powerful substance. Let's look at the practical aspects on how it is powerful and how it can help us a bit more. In Hebrews 11, that is the chapter on the heroes of faith. If you want to study faith, <coughs> you want to go to Hebrews 11. It's, a, it's a, probably one of the best chapters to study regarding faith, how to practice faith. If we look at the last verses of the chapter, <coughs> look at verse 33. Verse 33. Who through faith... Now notice that all these Old Testament saints, that's what verses... 1 through 32 is going to cover a bunch of names of Old Testament saints. Who through faith subdued kingdoms. Now notice right here, they were able to conquer kingdoms. See that? Subdue. So faith subdues. It can conquer kingdoms. Why is that? Because think about this. Some of these soldiers during the Old Testament, they were outnumbered by larger armies in the land of Canaan. But in order to overcome these empires, these larger armies, they had to believe what God told them to do. Amen. But because they didn't believe what God told them to do, then they lose the battle. Now think about a great example is Saul. Saul is probably one of the greatest examples where he did not have faith in the Lord. You might recall that 
when the Philistines were surrounding him, he lost faith in God and took action himself. Now that is the beginning of disaster and that's the beginning of where you lose power is where you think you got the power yourself that you take action for yourself. Do you understand? How often do we resort to that in our everyday lives? In our everyday lives. Think about it. In our job, up to relationships, up to even managing a church or your own family. It doesn't matter if you're a say believer. By instinct, we go by our own action rather than believing what God says and going by faith in what God told us to do. Amen? Amen That's the reason why you don't have power in your life is because you're in control all the time. So if, you're, if you want power in your life, you got to look at yourself and see how much you're in control. If you're always the one in control, then that's the reason why the Lord's power is not going on in your life. But the more that's hands off and faith in God, then he's going to show you things. And then if you just take his word by faith, then he's going to help you out here. Notice through faith subdue kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtain promises, stop the mouths of lions. Now this is all real stuff here. So notice how literally things of this world, creation itself, all these things are bent and controlled and overpowered by the power of faith itself. <coughs> Quench the violence of fire. So Daniel had faith when he was cast into a den of lions and then the Lord stopped the mouths of lions. They were over to uh, stop the fire that fell upon them. They escaped the edge of the sword. Out of weakness were made strong. Notice right here that when they were weak, the Lord used their weakness to make them stronger. Now notice that that is connected then with suffering. You might recall suffering is how you also receive power from God. And that is connected to the identification of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, correct? Mm -hmm. To apply, here's one thing that some people don't realize. Now, in my opinion, and I can be wrong, so I have to say that, but in my opinion, I think that this is the beginning step of power is faith. The starting point. What I mean by that is this. This, this is not the most important power, but it might as well be because we failed this first step. That's why all the other powers do not apply. Now you might say, what do you mean by that? Well, let's go back to the area on suffering here. The area of suffering is related to the death, burial, resurrection of Christ. Romans chapter 6. Now, you might recall that I told you that if we apply the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ to our everyday living, which means the flesh dies, uh, applying the death of the flesh, and yielding to the Spirit, the resurrected Spirit within us. That's what death, burial, resurrection is, okay? If we live that way, then our fleshly power can weaken, and then the Lord can take over. His power can take over. Suffering really helps us to do that. Suffering really kills our flesh, and you might say, why? Because we don't kill it ourselves. So suffering is really good that kills our flesh, and suffering forces us to yield to the Spirit. Why? Because we have nowhere else to turn to, you know, because our flesh is pretty much dead. So finally, we turn to the Lord and do it His way. That's how stubborn we fleshly human beings are. Anyway, when we come back to the main point here, that suffering helped us so much to uh, use the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But think about it. Faith is still important as a starting point 
because we will not even apply the death, burial, and resurrection if we don't believe in it. Now, do you know why you don't apply the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ? Because you don't believe in it. It's just plain and simple. You just don't believe in it. If you believe it works and you would do it, so then why don't you do it? Because you don't really believe it works. It. Look, if it's, it's really simple. If you really believe that uh, by touching an electric fence that you're going to get shocked and you're going to get hurt, you're going to commit the action of never, ever touching the electric fence. It's just that simple. Now, if you believe that your flesh is really going to die and that God's power can come into your life, if you apply the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, then you wouldn't, cotton, you wouldn't just uh, yield to your sin so many times by touching the electric fence, right? That's good, brother. Amen. I mean, if you really believe it's going to kill you, if it's going to kill your uh, power in God, but see, you don't really believe in that. Uh, you think it won't kill you that much, that electric fence, that sin, and somehow you can still get the power of God. Uh, as a matter of fact, you're going to now doubt the power of God. You're going to wonder if it's even real. That's why faith is so important, because even in suffering, as we undergo it, suffering won't help us if we don't cling on to our faith. Because if you give up in your faith, suffering ain't going to help you. Suffering can get you more distant from your faith. Unless you cling on to your faith, then suffering can be used to draw you even closer to God's power, closer to His presence. So I believe faith is the most important thing if you apply that as a beginning concept. That's the most important thing. If you apply it, then all other powers can apply. Think, think about it. The entire armor of God, you would be using that if you believe that they actually work. If you believe they actually work. If you believe in uh, the other powers that we discussed in our teaching, binding and loosing, confessing your sins, pleading the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, then you would constantly be using that. So faith unlocks to everything else in your power. Why? Because faith is a beginning point. Your salvation is by faith. It starts from there. From faith, it builds up. Everything else starts building up. So faith is the power. By the way, if you recall in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ in Romans chapter 6, what is the death of Christ? It's knowing your flesh is dead, right? What it, does that translate to? Believing. Believing. When you know it to be true, then you would believe it to be true. If you go to 2 Peter chapter 1, and then we'll go to verse 5, 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 5, but Hebrews chapter 11 will point out, stop the mouths of lions, weakness made strong, women raised their dead to life again. They were able to endure torture and death. That's, some, that's something else. Subdue kingdoms. Their suffering brought greater power. And then also they were able to withstand the torture and death for Jesus Christ. That's uh, power of faith. It's strange. I mean, think about it. Science don't cause people to do that. Science, uh, if you believe in science and science is your only religion to the atheists and to the unbelievers, they won't help you during uh, torture and during death and persecution. But faith does. They say, they call it a fairy tale. Call it whatever you want, but these people... We're, uh, we're able to find comfort yeah. and joy, and it was such a powerful thing that made them overcome persecution. Yeah. That's something science can't even do. Right. It's something very powerful here. Second Peter chapter 1, notice how everything adds because of faith at verse 5, verse 5, 2 Peter 1, 5. And beside this, giving all diligence, 
add to your what? Faith. Faith that is virtue and to virtue knowledge and to knowledge temperance and to temperance patience and to patience godliness and to godliness brotherly kindness and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice right here that faith is truly a starting point that every other thing starts to add up. So it is a starting point to power. Every time uh, you're failing to apply other powers, so listen up here. Every time you're failing to apply other powers, inspect your faith. So think about it. I mean, you want the filling power of the Holy Spirit, right? So one of the keys is to uh, desire, pray, and yield. So then while you're praying for the filling power of the Spirit and you're trying to yield to the filling power of the Holy Spirit, why aren't you still getting the filling power of the Spirit? Well, ask yourself, did you pray in faith for the filling power of the Spirit? Ask yourself, why are you having trouble yielding to the Holy Spirit? Maybe you don't believe in that. Your heart's not in it. See, it makes a huge difference, faith. Yeah. Right. So think about any power that you're trying to apply from the Bible upon your life, and if they're not working, if they're ineffective, then you have to inspect your faith. Now remember, faith is so powerful that uh, Pentecostals and Charismatics have abused it wrongly. What they have done is, like in healing line services, for example, they use that as a cop-out excuse where if a poor individual, which you should never do this in church, and we don't do this in church, this is just bad, you don't do that. But when a person doesn't get healed, what does the minister do as a cop-out so that he doesn't get accused of being a false healer? Oh, your faith is weak. All right, so we never do that. That is wrong. All right, that is unscriptural too. We can, we'll, uh, that can be discovered in the Bible. But there is a good point. Uh, they, they have a good point that they're pulling up. They don't just make stuff up, obviously, right? They just don't make stuff up. So the good point that they're taking out is this, is that it is true that Jesus Christ, that when he did his healings, there were cases where because people had faith, the Lord was able to have his healing upon them. And not only that, the disciples were not able to cast out devils because they lacked faith. What's my point here? My point is the power of God is ineffective when you try to use it if you lack faith. That's how important this thing is. So... If you're doubting God in some of the things that you're doing in your life, then all other powers are draining off. Okay. Did that make any sense? Yeah. So your prayers are ineffective no matter how many days you've been praying, for example. All the yielding to the Spirit that you've been practicing all your life, all your Bible reading, Bible memorization, because it's the sword of the Spirit, on, is becoming ineffective because your faith is not in it. I mean, think about it. The Bible says faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Yeah. So the word of God is even ineffective upon you if you don't believe. Yeah. Didn't Jesus even say that the seed is the word of God? But the heart that has unbelief can reject the power of the seed. Yeah. And so the word of God, even though it's powerful, its power is rendered useless upon that individual because that individual lacks faith. Did that make any sense? That's, good. that's how powerful this thing, uh, th faith is. So that's why I'm saying it's the most important. It ain't the most important, but it's the most important for a starting point. Because all other powers connect to this. Uh, if, you, if you lack faith, then the powers are going to start to uh, detach from each other. Now, remember from our previous two lessons, all these powers are all intertwined. You notice that? Or, uh, or, or uh, was uh, I just want to make sure were you guys lost or you, you or is it true? Okay, okay. So I, all the other powers were intertwined. You remember that, right? 
So they're all intertwined together. But as they're all intertwined together, they all connect to, back to a root source here, faith. You cut down faith, all that intertwining, all those powers collapse. Okay, so that's why faith is very important you want to apply. Now, we can spend all day on Hebrews 11. I mean, uh, I know that I went verse by verse in Hebrews 11, but it would do us good to do it again because we forgot, because we don't really apply it, and because we're human nature. But it would do you good, which I'm not going to do, is to go through Hebrews 11 again and look at every saint here. Now, uh, some of you uh, know, uh, don't know about dispensational salvation. What that means is salvation during a different time period was different from another time period. So obviously Old Testament salvation is not the same as New Testament salvation because Jesus didn't die on the cross yet in the Old Testament. So in the New Testament, we're saved by faith, not by works. But under the Old Testament, they didn't have Jesus dying on the cross. So they could not receive salvation by faith alone like we do today. What they had to do was they, were, they had to be saved by faith and works, which is why you notice a lot of wrong religions pull up wrong verses to teach you faith and works for salvation. But what you're going to find out, all, uh, the, all those verses are actually Jewish verses. See, But anyways, uh, back to the main point, if you look at all these Old Testament saints, notice how faith is a starting point that wrought works in them. For example, uh, Noah had faith. So because he had a strong faith in God, that faith caused him to build a boat that is three times longer than a football field. No scientific reasoning is going to motivate you to do that. But faith does. It's a strange power. Caused him to do that. Faith was able to uh, have Abraham and Sarah have a child together past their years of age. Faith was able to help, help out Moses to conquer the entire empire of Egypt. Faith is very important because much works were wrought out of the faith. Now, you want to do mighty works for God? The only way works can come out is from your faith. Now, if every saved believer is saved by faith, not by works, amen? And that's how we have our salvation. But now that we have salvation by faith in us, works has nothing to do with our salvation, but now we can try to do this for our everyday living. So our works coming out from this salvation in you, which is not by works, it's faith alone, but now our works coming out of your salvation by faith that you can use for the Lord, that's a power. Go to Philippians. Go to the book of Philippians. People try to teach this about uh, losing salvation, but this has nothing to do with works for salvation. It's more for works for your life, for your everyday living. It's talking about you already have salvation, so now you got to work that out of your life for your everyday living. All right, so Philippians chapter 2. Look at this power. A lot of people don't understand this. Philippians 2.12. I do not want to do a part 5, 6, and 7, so let me just wrap this up real quick for faith, okay? Philippians 2.12. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out, your own salvation with fear and trem trembling. Why? Not because you're working to get saved. It says work what? Out your own salvation. How can you work out your salvation if salvation was not in you to be in with? See that? And you're going to find that out the next verse, verse 13. For it is God which worketh in you. See, because you got salvation in you to begin with, that's why you want to work it out. For it is God which... So what does that mean? That means then, get this then, get this, salvation is in you still even if you don't work it out. Did that make any sense? Yeah, yeah. Philippians 2, 12 through 13 don't teach losing your salvation. It teaches eternal security. It teaches once saved, always saved. 
That verse sh taught you that uh, even if you don't work out your salvation, it still shows that salvation is in you. <laughs> Otherwise, Paul wouldn't tell them to work it out. <laughs> All right, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Because God is in you, working in you, within your salvation. But you've got to work it out. Meaning then, there are people who may not work it out, otherwise Paul wouldn't tell them to work it out. So in uh, verse 12 to 13, this faith is within people. Because it is, this power is in us, this special power within is noticed for it is God which worketh in you. Did you see that? Now what greater power is greater than God? So, the, the works out of your life, see that, are what? God's works. Did you understand that? That's good, amen. The works out of your life are God's works amen. in you. Amen. Is that a power you wanna under, uh, that you want to belittle? That's a special power. From what? Faith. Yeah. See, when we have that f salvation by faith, in us now because we believe in that let's work that out of us let's use that power i mean look if you had enough faith to believe that a 33 and a half year old jew raised himself from the dead yeah. come on that takes some faith really i mean you're going to believe some human being raised himself from the dead you're going to believe that uh, he's the one that saved your soul eternally from hell really 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 that's some faith you got. If you can believe in that, you can believe in His working in your little life. Amen. If you can believe your eternity in Him, what's so hard to believe your, the rest of your life in His hands? So see that? Use that power now. If you are able to trust Him with your soul, you should be able to trust Him, trust him with your mind, with your body, with your job, with your relationship, with uh, your family, with the things that you have and everything else. If you can trust Him with your soul, come on. Isn't your soul more precious than all those other things? Mind, body, uh, business, uh, house, possessions. You've entrusted Him with your most valuable part. And you can't trust Him with the rest of your valuables. That's strange, don't, don't you think so? So, that's why I use that power now. Trust Him with the rest. Trust Him with the rest. And by doing so, when you trust Him with the rest, a lot of great works can come out of your life. Amen. Because why? We've seen that example. Hebrews 11. Through such faith, such work can come out. But get this. Remember, the Old Testament saints, they didn't have the same salvation like we did. If they were to able to do that, those kind of mighty works without the same salvation by faith like we had, how much more should we be able to do Amen. with the salvation by faith that we have that the Old Testament saints did not have? You thought about that? What kind of works can be wrought out of our lives? So what are you doing? You're wasting your works? It's very powerful what you and I have. Do not underestimate the power of faith here. Now, I want us to go back to 2 Peter 1. Uh, well, before 2 Peter 1, let's go to James quickly. Let's go to the book of James. I want to discuss two powers very briefly. I'm going to try to make them very brief. I'll probably condense it to one verse. Let's go to James 5, and then your other one to go to Matthew 18. James 5 and Matthew 18. Now, uh, if I have some more time, I'll probably discuss these two things a little more. But for now, I'm going to try to abbreviate them. That way I can wrap it all up in this lesson. 
So one power we're going to discuss, which is very obvious and no one should underestimate, is the power of prayer. Now that's a no-brainer there. Prayer, oh, I hope I didn't move the whiteboard, sorry. Uh, prayer is very powerful and obviously we've seen it connected to faith. How powerful is prayer? Let's go to James chapter 5. James chapter 5. Notice right here in verse 17. Elias, verse 17, Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. And it rained not on the earth by the space of three and years and six months. And he prayed again. And the heaven gave rain and the earth brought forth her fruit. Now notice that prayer is so powerful. It says that he prayed earnestly that the windows of, of heaven, basically the rain was able to be shut off and the rain was able to come down again. That's how powerful prayer is. How powerful is prayer? Well, it's pretty obvious. Think about this. The power of salvation, correct? By faith. How were you saved by faith? By praying. That connected to confession. Remember that one? The power of confession. What is prayer? Basically talking to God. That's what it is. That's why prayer and faith are very intertwined many times. <coughs> prayer is so powerful because that's what got you saved. Is when you prayed it out to the Lord, I believe what your son Jesus Christ did on the cross for my salvation. That's how powerful prayer is. How powerful is prayer? We wouldn't be praying for every one of these needs and requests. Think about it. These needs and requests, if we trust in other powers to take care of them. I mean, we got money, right? I mean, we can find the doctors, don't we? We can find the medical resources, right? We have the connections. We have the internet. We got the world's resources. So, I mean, why do we have to request for prayer? if we already have all the powers taken care of, unless we realize that those things have no power to answer and take care of those needs. And that's why we ask a whole bunch of people, will you pray for these needs instead? Because I'm relying on the power of prayer here and not your money on this and not on sending me a doctor for this one or this, or this help or that help. Did you notice that? That's how powerful prayer is. Now, that's a no-brainer on the power of prayer. Now, Matthew chapter 18, this is connected to the name of Jesus Christ. Under His name, we have seen how the Lord used it during the times of the Acts of the Apostle. During the Acts of the Apostle, it was used for healing it was used to cast out devils. So there is power in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, uh, like I told you before, the, this is during the Acts of the Apostles, right? So what's that called? That's during their timeline, the Apostles, their Acts. That's not ours. So I'm not going to get into that one. But even though... We're not doing the healing and casting out devils. What do we use his name for? We definitely use it for, for prayer. So if prayer is powerful, think about this. Why do we have to conclude it in Jesus' name? Jesus Christ said, you ask anything in my name and I will do it. See, so when you pray to God, you know what God wants? Listen, when you pray, it's not just praying. He wants you to conclude it with Jesus' name. That shows how powerful or integral His name is. If we go to Matthew chapter 18, notice the power of God under His name. Verse 20. Verse 20. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. But that is connected, notice, with prayer as well. Verse 19. Again, I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth 
as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. That's prayer. We can see that. So two of them are coming in agreement, praying to God, and God will bring it to pass under what? Together, in verse 20, under his name. But here's another thing. Remember the power of binding and loosing? Remember that power? His name is connected to that at verse 18. The power of binding and loosing. Did you forget 1 Corinthians 5? What did Paul say at 1 Corinthians 5? We saw the power of binding and loosing there. He, was bind, uh, he bound or retained the sins of an individual when he kicked out of the church, but he put it under what? The name of the Lord Jesus Christ at verse 4, right? Yeah. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because when we are uh, calling out, calling forth the power, see that? That's what wizards, magicians are doing. Calling out spells, right? They'll call it spells. But we call it prayer. See, we don't call it chants or spells. We call them prayers. When we call those things out through prayer, what we do is we don't do like Harry Potter or all these other uh, uh, messed up, demon-possessed magicians, wizards, witches, etc. You know, I call upon the names of the gods of blah, 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 blah. You know, the, the, you know how long is their spell, right? You know? you know what I could do? I could do a five-second prayer and say, in Jesus' name, amen, you know. If we had a, you know, wizard casting contest, you know, you know, you know, how, you know, these things like Harry Potter and, you know, putting out the wand, calling out the spell, you know, I call upon the gods of the blah, 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 and three seconds in Jesus' name, boom, and then he just yeah. loses the battle like that. <laughs> yeah, imagine how silly that is. I call upon the gods of blah, 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 blah. And, like, you're going to win a battle that way, you know, that long, right? You know, prayer does not have to be 50 minutes long. You know that. Amen. The, Lord can hear, uh, the Lord can hear at that instant moment. It can be what we call Nehemiah prayers. Yeah. In other words, uh, you don't have to have the, some object, you know, like a wand or the right position and call upon all the right names and all that kind of stuff. You can just from the heart, you don't even have to say it verbally. Sometimes it can be from the heart. It comes out real briefly in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, uh, why do kids, uh, are, why are kids deceived, especially, especially Christian kids deceived in all this kind of witchcraft stuff nowadays and want to do that? I mean, that's just wickedness. I mean, you got the power of prayer and the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is far more awesome than that. Far more advantageous. So the name of the Lord Jesus Christ is uh, where we can receive power as well. Uh, we go back here. Um, I said 2 Peter 1. So I've discussed the two powers very briefly. It was connected to prayer. It was connected to the powers of binding and loosing. Which is try to imitate, which they don't call prayers. The witches, what they do is that they call them spells because they have to spell it out, right? Yeah, they sure have to spell it out. You know, when you spell it out, you have to go through every single letter, right? That's the idea. But we just call it out. <laughs> That's what we call prayer. Witches refer to them as spells, incantations, chants, etc., rituals. But did you notice how the Catholic Church is trying to turn it into witchcraft? Yeah. Our brother was pretty tame. It's worse than Catholic witchcraft. That's what the Catholic religion is. I mean, what they've done is that they've taken witchcraft and then turned prayer into some ritual and spell and mumbo jumbo. And you'd be surprised not how Catholic their objects and rituals are, but how pagan it is. If you don't believe it, take a trip to Vatican City, all right? We saw it ourselves, all right? It was more pagan than Catholic. It was way more pagan than Catholic. It was just wicked over there. Okay, but anyway, 
when we go to 2 Peter chapter 1, now let's discuss these other powers which are, far, uh, which are really important, and I'll see if I can cover them in 15 minutes or 15 to 20 minutes. Notice right here, faith is the beginning at verse 5, correct? All right, but what's the last one? Yeah, someone said it. Charity at verse 7, right? What does that show? Charity is a higher power than faith. So go to 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians 13. Charity is not just love, it's love in action. Love in action. So the King James Bible has it right because it's not just love, but you got to put forth the act of love into it. Now, I'm going to just uh, call it love uh, quite often. That's what I'm going to do. But I want you to know that whenever I say that, I want you to think about love in action, which is why charity is a better translation in your King James Bible. But anyway, if you look at 1 Corinthians 13, 13, look at how charity is more powerful than faith. Verse 13, and now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three, but the what? Greatest of these is charity. Now go to verse 2. Go to verse 2. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, see that? All faith. So let's say that you got your faith down and correct. So if you have your faith, all other powers should be operating well, right? That's how important it is. But look at this. Though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains. Remember, faith has that much power. It moves mountains. But notice it is still less powerful, but even to the point of nothing compared to the power of charity. Notice that, uh, and have not charity, I am what? Now, did you understand that? So let's say you got faith down right. But if you have no charity, you still cut down all your power supply. So get this now. Um, if I draw it out, it'll probably make things more um, understandable. Let's see here. I hope this will make any sense. Charity is from the top here. Uh, let's see. And then here are all the other powers we are talking about here. These are all rooted and grounded from the power of faith. That's how it works. With this faith, all other powers can be able to proceed and operate. However, on the top, all these powers, what they're supposed to have as well is charity on the top. That's the idea. That's how the power system works. But if you cut off the top of the power, the verse insists that everything will become nothing then. You might say, why? Because charity is very important to God, which can show something here. This shows that you can have faith and you can have all the powers, but what God sees... So get this now. What God sees is nothing. You're a zero still. Wait, so if I have answered prayers from God, if I have mighty works coming out of my life that God has used, am I not right with God? Am I not, uh, am I not okay? No, you're still not okay. Why? Because even if you have all the powers operating, if there's no charity, God still sees you as a zero. That's important to understand. Do you see how important charity is? So let's say you are the most powerful Christian in the world. You can become the most powerful Christian in the world that God can mightily use. I mean, look at verse 3. You got that power of what? Enduring suffering. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, 
and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Why? Because the point in your Christian life, get this now, listen, the point of your Christian life is not to have power. See, from this lesson, that's what you got, right? Like, I want power from God. I want power from God. But that's not what you should get from this lesson. What you got to get from this lesson is, I've got to love God and others. That's the greatest power. So, uh, remember, Jesus said this, is that if you want to fulfill all the commandments of God, and I mean by commandments, which includes faith, then that means, right? If God tells you to believe in him. Which includes all the other powers, binding and loosing and using Jesus' name, praying, applying the armor of God, all that. Jesus said if you want to follow all the commandments of God, it's only two things. You love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and you love your neighbor as yourself. If you just have love, all these other things naturally operate without you knowing. That's very important. That's how powerful charity is. Now, if people still doubt the power of charity, let's look what charity does. Notice how a lot of different things happen because of charity. Look at verse 4. Charity suffereth long and is kind. See, that charity can endure. It can put up with so many problems and things that go on in your life. Look at verse 7. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Now, why is charity powerful? Look at verse 8. This is the evidence. Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. What, what is this verse pointing out? This verse is pointing out that uh, all the knowledge uh, in this life and then the, the different languages in this world and prophecies that occur in our life, everything can pass away. But charity, it will never pass away. If that's powerful, then think about what Jesus said. Heaven and earth shall pass away. But my words shall not pass away. What does that mean? Charity lasts longer than creation itself. If you don't believe that, you know what was before creation? You know what was before creation? Get this, what was before creation was God's love upon mankind. Of that foreknowledge. And he created the world to begin with for what? For us. See, love preceded. Charity preceded creation. Ain't that powerful? A lot of people don't understand how powerful charity is. Much power within it. But a lot of people underestimate that power. They don't use that power. Look at Romans chapter 8. Romans 8. That's the reason why you can endure suffering and torture. It's not just faith, it's charity. Now think about this. There is no doubt faith is the beginning point, correct? Faith is the beginning point. But if you were to pick, listen, if you were to pick between uh, love or charity, as you undergo suffering and persecution, the preferable thing is actually love. Because if you love God and choose that, all other commandments will fall into place. Perhaps even faith itself as well. So Romans chapter 8. Uh, look at verse 35. Verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long, we are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Now get this, this is how powerful charity is. Faith helps overcome the world, correct? Faith conquers the world. But charity is more than overcoming. 
Charity is more than conquering. Did you see that? Faith overcomes the world, but charity is more than overcomers of the world. That's something important, don't you think so? Nay, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. It's the power of love. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The power of love. How powerful is love? Listen, love is so powerful, it rendered God to become weak. It made God give up his own life, set aside his power, limit himself to take sin and hell upon himself. That's how powerful it is. Now, I'm not trying to say that love is power, more powerful than God, but I will tell you one thing. The Bible says God is love. Mm -hmm. That's how powerful love is. You thought about that? That's how powerful charity is. That's how powerful love is. But uh, we don't take action of that. Uh, it's, so, it's so simple. I mean, love makes you do the craziest things. Isn't that simple? Even without a Christian perspective, love makes you do the craziest things. Love can make you do really stupid things too. Why? It has a powerful effect. Okay, uh, we understand the power of charity, and then we're going to go to James chapter 1. James chapter 1, and then we're going to talk about the power of the fruit of the Spirit. And then we'll call it uh, the end, all right? Hope that you learned something from uh, these series and that you'll be able to apply it into your life and then see God doing great, powerful things. The fruit of the Spirit, here we go. If you've been there in my preaching, then you would be familiar with this one. James chapter 1, notice in verse 2, verse 2, My brethren, count all joy when ye fall into divers temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Now keep your hand here. Go back to 2 Peter 1 again. Look at 2 Peter 1. 2 Peter 1. We saw the starting point, faith, at verse 5. The end point, charity, at verse 7. But notice in verse 8, For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor what? Unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So it's the fruit of the Spirit. You'll notice that it relates to James chapter 1, verse 2 through 4. Patience having her perfect work. So the fruit of patience is coming out. If people doubt that, then 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 6 shows the steps of verse 5, faith, trying of faith in verse 5, become verse 6, patience, and then it brings forth fruit according to verse 8. But also, uh, let's see right here, uh, James 1 calls it patience bringing her perfect work, but uh, James chapter 5 verse 7 will point out that patience brings forth its fruit. That patience brings forth its fruit. So there is no doubt that James 1, uh, 2 through 4, it's all connected to the fruit. It's all connected to fruit. But this fruit is obviously the fruit of the Spirit if we were to go back to Galatians 5. 
Galatians chapter 5. But notice that the fruit is singular, right? Now, the greatest deception from Satan is people think that, uh, Christians think that the power of God lies within your fruits. You want to be careful of that. When they look at your fruits, what they mean is the numbers in your church, the successes that you have, the souls that you led to salvation, and et cetera, et cetera. Because those are evidences of your power that when they look at your fruits, which is true. The Bible says, by their fruits ye shall know them. So they want to see evidences. However, the thing is that a lot of it could be evidence, not from the Holy Spirit, but from the works of the flesh. Sometimes people don't realize that. Sometimes there are people who have a lot of so-called fruits or results, but they may have weak, they may not be spirit-filled compared to other people who are more spirit-filled in power. So you can't just really rely on the fruits here. What the Bible calls it is singular fruit. If you go to Galatians chapter 5, notice uh, verse 22, it says, but the fruit of the Spirit. So it's singular. Uh, why is this singular, fruit of the Spirit? Because what we have to realize is it's not talking about your fruits, all the evidences that you have in your life. This is talking about personally within you. Basically, your spiritual state. That's what we're getting at here. Your spiritual state. Now, uh, if people doubt that, notice that the verse says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. Now, that sounds like your spiritual state. That doesn't sound like results. That don't look like results. That don't look like numbers. That looks more like your spiritual state. You'll notice right here, this is definitely referring to spiritual state. If we go to verse 18, context. But if he be led of the Spirit, see that? If you look at verse 16, walk in the Spirit. See that? This is all what? Your spiritual state. Spiritual state. So how are you going to get the fruit of the Spirit? How are you going to get your spiritual state? Well, we saw in James 1 that it had to do trying of your faith. See that? So is your faith being put to the test? Well, yeah, you're going through that, suffering. Then what it's supposed to do, it's supposed to bring out patience. Where it's contentment. And then Peter points out, if you go to 2 Peter, all the other elements, correct? Which eventually reaches to the point. So let's say this is step one. Then we go to step two, then it turns to step three, and then four through nine or whatever. And then this is the final step, charity. When you reach over here, then what happens is, then you reach the completion of the fruit of the Spirit, so that you may not be unfruitful, Second Peter 1 argues. But this also shows you, not just 2 Peter 1, but the fruit of the Spirit. Notice the first thing is what? Love. Did you notice that? The first thing? It shows how important that power is. Love. So love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Now how powerful is this? Uh, is it referring to spiritual life, spiritual state? Because yeah, verse 25, if we live in the Spirit... Let us also walk in the Spirit. So that's what it's referring to. It's not your results, your numbers, your evidences. But verse 23, I like to say this. Against such, there is no law. Now, if you have your complete spiritual state, there is no law in this universe that can come up against it. See? Nothing. If you think about so many men who are spirit-filled, who were filled with the fruit of the Spirit as well, who lived their life that way, there was no power in this entire universe. It just contradicted the laws of thermodynamics. 
It contradicted the laws of nature, the laws of common sense, where a bunch of people believed in a 33 and a half year old dead Jew, raised himself from the dead, and that he would give them the true meaning of life, and they want to give the same eternal life to others, and willing to die for it, willing to lose their children over it, their family over it. There's no explainable phenomena or scientific law can explain that. Against such there is no law. That's the mysterious power. And that is the power of the fruit of the Spirit. If you have that fruit of the Spirit, that will be above any other spiritual power. The fruit of the Spirit basically can be defined as even on top of charity. Basically completeness. So you reach the end. The evidence is 2 Peter 1, which we discovered. Now, all you have to do, uh, now, what contradicts the fruit of the Spirit? This is the end result. What contradicts it? The flesh, right? Galatians 5. What did I tell you before? 90% of your power being cut off, being destructive, is your flesh. So you've got to destroy, you've got to get rid of that flesh. All right? That's the most destructive the most uh, completeness would be right here, fruit of the Spirit. So these are opposite ends of the spectrums between all these powers that we've talked about. The destruction of the flesh, the fruit of the Spirit. Over here we got faith, which can overcome the destruction of the flesh, right? The identification, death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ, and all these other powers that intertwine. Prayer, armor of God, binding and loosing the blood of Jesus, the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and so many others. Charity on top of it, and then it completes it with the fruit of the Spirit. All right, so I hope you got a better idea of the picture, you know, on how this power operates and that you will apply it upon your life and see God moving this time, if you haven't seen God moving upon your life. I pray, Heavenly Father, tonight's teaching has been life-changing and that it will be applied, Father, and I guess where we can start out is faith. Help us to believe, Father. Help us to believe. And as we believe, help us to always love you and love each other. And then see all these powers intertwine, connect, and be brought forth out of our life. As you said, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God which worketh in us. So you're the greatest power of all, and God is love. So may we apply and work out these things and see you move in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.